everyone. Welcome to ELI's summer school session. This is the final one we have for you today, Land Use and the Law. My name is Chandra Middleton. I'm the director of the Associates program here at ELI. Um, you can find more information and uh, future events on ELI.org. I encourage you to visit that. Um, so summer school has been brought to you by not only members of ELI, but also the DC Bars Environment, Energy, and Natural Resources section. So today's session is going to be taught by Gus Bauman, who is of counsel at Beverage and Diamond, and he focuses on land use and environmental issues, advising clients on such matters as comprehensive planning, project development, and natural resource regulations. His recent matters have included zoning, historic preservation, wetlands, NEPA, TMDL from the Clean Water Act program, and Clean Air Act transportation conformity issues, as well as writing Amiti, Amiti Curie, Curie briefs to the U.S. Supreme Court on regulatory takings of private property and wetlands regulations. We are also joined by Sarah Bronin, who is an Associate Professor of Law and the Program Director for the Center for Energy and Environmental Law at the University of Connecticut School of Law. She is a licensed architect and an attorney, and has researched and published in the areas of property, land use, historic preservation, green building, and renewable energy law. And her scholarship focuses on creating an economically and environmentally sustainable American city. So we welcome both of them. And with that, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so uh, one of the things we did last year that uh, we wanted to start with this year was just uh, to talk briefly about how we got to where we are. So uh, maybe guess you want to start. Right. Um, right. We'll and maybe to just sort of, you know, we could go around the room very quickly and get a sense of, you know, whether you're in an agency, in a, in a company, a firm, a summer intern someplace. <coughs> It'd be just helpful to know for us as we tailor our comments, but we could start right here with you. Hi, um, I'm a summer intern at the White House Council on Environmental Quality. As I state, um, I'm a summer intern at the Chesapeake Legal Alliance, which is a nonprofit organization. I'm Mike, and I'm also a intern at the Chesapeake Legal Alliance. Okay. <coughs> I'm Jeff, I'm the summer intern at EPA. Mm -hmm. I'm Beth, I'm a fellow at EPA's Office of Sustainable Communities. Hey, I'm Harry. I'm Alex, I'm a summer associate at Beverage and Dine. I'm Felix, I'm an intern here at ELI. My name is Jonah Richmond, and I am a uh, employee at the Environmental Protection Agency and a first year at Mount Hospital. I'm a summer intern at ELI. I'm Brittany, also an intern at ELI. I'm Sarah, also an intern at ELI. I'm Kate, an intern at ELI. Uh, my name is Ren Anderson, and uh, I'm a practicing attorney who's interested in moving into land use. Great. 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 Yeah. Okay. <coughs> well, um, uh, I graduated from law school in '74, and it was during a recession. Um, it was nothing like the Great Recession, but the '73, '74 recession um, was not a good. And so it just so happened that I was at a law school, um, uh, Washington University, um, that had a well-known, I had no idea, the typical thing how you fall into things, as you all know. I had a well-known professor who's still there named Daniel Mandelberg, and he was running the land use law program in the middle of law. And um, so I fell into his program, they did open law journal, I ended up working on that and doing stuff with the professor. Um, <clears throat> but I didn't go to school for any of those reasons. I went there. So, I mean, you know, I'm just saying there's no magic reason we do what we do. So I ended up there, and then there was this agency in Maryland that was looking for a lawyer. They came to the law school. They recruited. Um, I came here in 74, right out of law school, to work for this land use agency in suburban Maryland outside Washington, D.C., <clears throat> the general counsel's office. And, you know, you, you cover the waterfront. It, it was a regulatory, <coughs> legislative litigation, it was everything. This agency had a lot of power, um, and it was controlled land use in the two counties adjoining Washington, D.C. So I did that for a bunch of years, 
then one day I got a call that this large trade association in Washington was looking for a land use type of lawyer. So I was asked to go in an interview. At the interview, I remember um, explaining earlier, you know, like you never order spaghetti in a job interview. The guy interviewing me clearly, and this is the time of Watergate and all of that, and um, he made it real clear um, that he didn't like lawyers, but he had to hire one. <laughs> and he said, um, and besides that, all the people, you know, being arrested and convicted in the Watergate scandal, they're all lawyers. And I said, yeah, but they're all Republican lawyers. Um, turned out he was a Republican, of course, but he still hired me. Um, uh, it, it, was, it, it was one of those things where you can't help yourself, but you end up. So I ended up for many years being head of the legal department of this trade association it was called the Home Builders. And then from there, I joined my law firm. I got lateraled in. And I mention all of this to you because the point was I was in an agency, which was a local slash regional agency. Then it ended up in a big trade association. Then I got recruited into this law firm. And I had never been a summer associate. I never worked in a law firm. I get lateraled right in as a partner. And then I made all these promises that I would be there. And then a year and a half later, I got appointed to chair this agency in Maryland. So I had to leave the law firm. Um, so I did that for a bunch of years. And then I came back to the law firm where I am today. So it's a very circuitous thing. And it's just like what happens in your lives. A lot of it is just pure happenstance, luck, whatever. All right. Um, <coughs> well, unlike Gus, I've only had one job really through uh, since graduating from law school. So I, I don't have the quite the uh, range of diverse experiences that Gus has. Um, but I started, before law school, I uh, started in architecture school. And I, um, for five years, I got the Bachelor of Architecture degree. And I realized that we were doing so many awesome projects paper, but that it would never actually be buildable in the real world, and that probably learning law was a good idea to figure out what was possible within um, the existing legal frameworks, um, everything from building codes to zoning, which we'll talk about today, um, and it you know, may be useful otherwise. So I guess I went to law school with that purpose in mind, um, and came out on the other end, um, starting at UConn as a, a research Washington, D.C.'s historic districts, uh, which uh, that I interned at that summer at the National Trust for Historic Preservation, an organization uh, where my sister now works at their for-profit subsidiary, which is sort of uh, cool. Um, but uh, that got me interested in historic preservation um, and law and how that, um, how it the legal strictures on historic preservation. So then after graduate school, I went into law school and focused in on that area. Um, and I, we didn't have a historic preservation law class in law school. Um, so when I started teaching, that was the first class I developed materials for and taught. And eventually that turned into a historic preservation law book that was published um, last month or two months ago. But um, but that, I, again, I, I mean, maybe my, I was more directed from the beginning. Um, but you know, I sort of sustained this path. And I'm, I, I think it's endlessly fascinating. And hopefully, if this is a kickoff introduction, um, you'll find it as interesting. And I should say, I, I do consult for um, various clients, mostly private developers, um, doing work in the Connecticut uh, region, uh, but also elsewhere. So I do have a, a, that to help influence my scholarship. And an article that's coming out on energy, building the way of renewable energy, uh, focuses on a project that I helped with in New Haven called 360 D Street. So, you know, there is some interplay there, uh, but certainly Gus is going to be the leading uh, uh, contributor here. developer of 
And the third group is government at all levels. And really, I say at all levels, although we probably think of uh, zoning ordinances happening at, at a very local level. There still, still is a lot of federal involvement in land use. And guess we'll actually talk about some uh, federal statutes that play a role in how we use land. Um, so let's start with landowner slash developers. Especially when you're talking about private developers, you're, you're talking about uh, people whose goal Number one goal is efficiency. <coughs> so they want to create, and by and large, usually private developers want to create a project for uh, the biggest bang for your buck, uh, efficient financially, uh, and also a project that will take a short amount of time to build. So you know, think about the, this concept of efficiency as being one potential overriding goal of developers' motivations. Um, so what do they have to worry about? or even oh, property owners who want to do something with their property have a lot to worry about uh, when it comes to land use law. Um, and they could be worried about angry neighbors who might use the law to stall the project. They might be worried about uh, you know, different rules in financing. They might be worried about environmental regulations being enforced on the property or being changed, being more strict um, than they might have anticipated. More generally, they might be worried about changes in the market changes in the physical condition of their property, um, assembling the architect, engineer, and other key figures and making them work together, uh, and more. So it's, for developers, it's a very risky business. How do you feel? Yeah, I mean, <coughs> developers, property owners, we call them the applicant. But you think about it, they're coming to the government asking for permission to do something to the land. So they're going in there on bended knee. Think about this in terms of business. When you think about other kinds of business, you don't have to do that. You know, you may have to do it initially to build a factory or a store, but afterwards, if you're running your business, you don't have to keep going back to the government agency. If you're in the development business, you're always going to the agency, always. So you're always worried about ticking people off and getting them angry with you for whatever reason, even if it's irrational, because then you have to go back there maybe a year or two or three years later to do something else. Because you're always seeking an what's called an entitlement, a permit, an approval to build something, to expand it, whatever. So they, they, they walk this weird path that Sarah's talking about, which is unique in terms of how entitlements work in the United States. So applicants, the, the developer or the property owner or the builder, they all are different going into that. And, and so they're proposing, the neighborhood is opposing, and the government disposes. You know, and that's what they're doing. The government has to decide what to do about when they've got these groups in front of them. As I say, the part of this is that it tends to be in public hearings. So it tends to get very political. And that is another reason this is a unique field. It is down to earth, and it's real. You're dealing with human beings, Emotions, rational and irrational. You're dealing with fears because people fear change. I don't care what's being proposed, people fear change. They like what they know and they fear the unknown. And so that's what causes this whole land use thing to be both a little complex but also fascinating. Yeah, so that uh, Gus touched on the second group that, that I mentioned, which is neighbors. And, you know, if there are clear barriers for neighbors to organize to say one thing or another about a project. So neighbors are diffuse. Their interests may be very different, um, and their interests may not align. So Gus spoke of neighbors that may object to a project, and maybe neighbors that support a project. <coughs> Sometimes it may be complicated for neighbors to figure out what they think about a project proposal. For example, you think about a shopping center. So a shopping center is great on the one hand because it generates taxes, it generates jobs. On the other hand, it brings traffic congestion, maybe some air pollution uh, issues. So, you know, it may not be clear what neighbors think about that. Uh, similarly, you know, condos, building a condo, again, it may generate property taxes, may um, improve, a, let's say, a, a, a climbing historic structure, uh, but they may also bring school children. 
sometimes find themselves in a situ- often find themselves in a situation where they try to predict one thing and then something else may happen uh, that they that they didn't predict. So neighbors are a key player in the land use game, and they're given special rights in local land use regulations. Um, one big question in land use law that I wanted to touch on just briefly was um, whether regulation matters. So when you think about developers and neighbors, you might ask, in the absence of regulation, would the developer want to build something that is good for neighbors? You might think, you know, there are reasons uh, that you might say yes. So a developer might want to build something that's aesthetically pleasing or that fits into the community because that will allow them to sell the project or, or add u- attract users to the project that will benefit them down the line. Um, you know, ideally regulations would track these things so that the goals of the developer and the goals of the community are aligned, but that's not always the case. So when we go through our presentation, we're really going to be talking a lot about the regulatory side. We're not really going to consider so much what would happen if we had no regulations, um, but just something uh, to keep in mind. Uh, and so the third group is, is local governments. So the involvement of local governments really depends on, uh, it's governments in general, we'll talk about local governments, and we'll talk about um, federal uh, role in his uh, portion. But, but for, for local governments, their role in the land use game depends on the powers that the state gives to them. So you may have heard of state standard zoning enabling acts. These were uh, passed by all the states, and they basically tell localities what they can and can't do in regulating land use. Uh, Typically, the states will allow localities to craft uh, regimes that provide for certain lot sizes, certain uses, uh, building bulks, uh, and and guess we'll talk more about those. (coughs) So uh, another type of uh, government that we're not going to touch on unless we want to, unless there are questions, are the special districts. So there are lots of different kinds of special districts, water districts, um, municipal utility districts. I've written a article about uh, MUDs in Texas, which um, have surprising uh, powers in the land use uh, regulatory and uh, property law realm. Airport districts, transportation districts, agricultural districts, these all play a really important role in uh, land use planning and regulation, and it's not something that we cover a lot No, I mean, <clears throat> um, and just to let you know before we dive into all of this is that the outline that you've got lays out for you the legal construct of what we're talking about, moving from the federal to state constitutions to the state statutes to the local ordinances, the planning zoning subdivision ordinances, and all the other ordinances that come into play. <clears throat> and uh, so that's something you can take away with you because it lays out, you know, your mental hooks for where you put terms of what we're talking about, because this whole regulatory thing we're talking about is all grounded in federal and state constitutions, state statutes, and local ordinances. Then, as you know, regulations flow from all of that, and the regs will be local regs, and there are state regs, and there are federal regs, but most of what we're talking about, we're talking about land use, we're basically talking about, as Sarah said, local power, local authority, the exercise of the police power. Historic preservation and aesthetic regulation laws. 
are really, they deal with aesthetics, but to some extent they do deal with uses as well. So those are, um, those uh, may be significant uh, in, the, in if you practice in those communities where those are passed. Uh, government can own land, so there's a whole area of land use regulation that deals with publicly owned land, and we won't really be talking too much about that um, today. And then there are other things too, so state government conservation protection, uh, and we can uh, talk about those in the Q&A if, if you'd like. But for now, we'll, we'll focus our presentation on these three areas, planning, zoning, and eminent domain. So I'll start with, with uh, planning. And, and, and just as a general overview, we should start by saying that land use laws, we know it didn't really begin until the 1920s. So as far as the legal history of land use regulation really starts in the Before land use laws we know it began to emerge in the 1920s, the way we dealt with problems in land use was through nuisance law. So nuisance is a concept, you, you, if you've had property law, if you're a law student or a lawyer, um, you learn about in property law. And nuisance relates to uh, situations where somebody's doing something with their land that interferes with another person's ability to enjoy their their. So nuisance is a noxious use. Think about uh, noises or uh, smells, uh, lights <coughs> can be a uh, nuisance. Um, but if you had a factory bothering a neighbor, the way to resolve that dispute in the 19th century, 18th century, um, before the tide turned in land use regulation was through a lawsuit. So you would have a neighbor taking the factory owner to court and saying, you know, you're <coughs> dumping whatever on my land and I don't like it, uh, you need to pay me for it or you need to stop the activity. So nuisance was really to do that. The problem with nuisance regulation, as you can probably predict, is that it's really piecemeal. So as American cities grew more quickly, um, people realized that they needed a system of rules that were in place that would allow people to come to some agreements with each other about the way land would be used before bad things happened. And so that's when we started uh, things like planning, uh, with things like zoning regimes. Planning, uh, and Gus will talk about zoning, but planning <coughs> really evolved um, prior to zoning. And planning uh, was, uh, you know, I guess you could even say it started with the emergence of this country. So we planned out how we were going to use the territories. Northwest Ordinance parceled out land and, 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 and set out land survey system that we still use today. Um, by the 1850s, mid-19th century, we had the emergence of parks within cities. So like Central Park in New York, uh, Bushnell Park in uh, Hartford, where I teach, um, these became central organizing features of cities. In the last half of the 19th century, we saw a major shift to urban areas. So you had streetcar transportation lines beginning to be laid out. Uh, you had the clustering of business, you had the rise of tenements and unsanitary housing conditions, um, and increasingly dense developments uh, all across the country. So as these things started happening, these demographic shifts started happening, planning became more important, and, and, and really also, I guess, too, became more important in the early part of the 20th century. So you had several movements that were competing uh, with each other to become the, the primary mode of planning in this country. And to some extent, we've adopted all of them. So one of the movements was the City Beautiful Movement. And this was the Daniel Burnham um, Chicago uh, World's Fair or World Columbian Exposition. Um, and the idea is that if you build grand, beautiful public buildings and spaces, you can improve the social and moral fiber of everybody around you. So DC is a great example, uh, is a great place to find evidence of the city's beautiful movement in planning. Uh, and my favorite example is Union Station, which you probably uh, know is undergoing, if you've traveled in and out of there, is undergoing extensive renovations. Um, although it always seems to be under renovation, to be honest. Uh, but right now, there's, I think it was earthquake damage too, so right now there's, there's, there's a lot happening there. But, but right in the 
think it does uplift people who come to DC, and I don't know if it improves their moral fiber, but you know, it, it's it's a it's a very positive. It's experience. a burning building. Yeah, of course. And it's a burning, getting a burning prison. Um, so another idea, another movement in planning, and again, I just I just wanted to give you some background on um, you know ideas of cities before we get into into why you know zoning uh, started to emerge uh, is the Garden City, and I actually brought. Um, Ebenezer Howard's book, The Garden of Cities of Tomorrow, and I'll, I'll just pass it around if you uh, give this to you. Um, and there's a few uh, um, plans in there that show uh, what his concept of the Garden City was. And so he was a British planner. Uh, he thought that we should have low density, low line uh, cities with industry, culture, housing, and green belts all planned out. Um, and so Americans reading this book and following this model started to think about um, laying out cities that were far away from these dense, dirty urban cores that had been building in population in the second half of the 19th century. Um, so you had, um, in the idea of the garden city, the rise of suburbs, of course, which didn't really happen until the 1950s, but that, that's the intellectual origins, I think, of the suburbs. Uh, and then you had uh, the radiant city concept. So this was um, the idea of Swiss architect Le Corbusier, and I actually brought his book on this too, which the cover of this particular um, volume shows what he thought a radiant city should be. So he thought we should build really tall skyscrapers in a car-centric city that would be um, set into tranquil park-like zones. Again, these are really broad generalizations, but I send just send this around to give you ideas about um, our, our different concepts of the city. And so in Le Corbusier's view, high density, lots of open space. And if you look at those buildings, they may seem familiar to you because they look like a lot of the public housing projects, the large scale public housing projects that have, were built in the 60s and, and other urban renewal type projects. And, and two, uh, the ascendance of the automobile uh, in even cities that, that had never so the Radiant City, our third major movement um, in planning and, and in the early 20th century. So you had, you know, I'm trying to figure out what to include here. There's so much. Um, by the mid-century, planning had expanded to include private lands. Um, and, you know, by that time, you had the rise of the suburbs, dependence on the automobile, decline of central cities. what was around them and what developed around them. So um, federal government got involved and been involved to some extent in the 1930s and then large scale public planning processes. But uh, by the mid 20th century, uh, even the federal government was involved in, in mandating that, that uh, certain local governments have <coughs> comprehensive plans if they were gonna receive federal funding for urban renewal projects. So that's, I guess, one example of Use interchangeably, but these are the land use plans 
adopted by cities and counties and towns. Now, as Sarah's pointing out, uh, planning is um, viewed as soft. Zoning is viewed as hard in the sense that zoning is black letter law. So it's law. Planning, a plan, in most places in America is not law. It's a guide. Um, there are exceptions um, <coughs> where, um, as Sarah noted, a state like Oregon or a state like Hawaii, um, where zoning must follow the plan. But in the vast majority of the United States, the plan is viewed by everyone involved in the land use game as only a plan. Now, <coughs> that said, um, most states do have state enabling laws that say you must have a local land use plan. We'll call it a local land use plan, we'll call it a comprehensive plan, a general plan, or a master plan. Um, but when you deal with um, legislators and, and governors and executives, they look at planning in most jurisdictions as it's a good thing to do, it's a smart thing to do, uh, but if a good idea comes down the pike, you know, plan's just a plan, you know, but if we're going to get that Nissan factory here, um, uh, you know, the plan is just a guideline. And um, uh, the, the best way to, and the zoning is black federal law. The best example I can give is, um, and this, this affects, and this is also applies to um, all the agency people here um, who deal with um, regs and guidelines, you know, and I always get the question as I segue from planning to zoning, we're talking about reg land use regulation. You know, what's the difference between regulation and guideline? Um, these things get fought over and litigated all the time. I've been involved in many cases and situations where the agency will say, it's only a policy. You know, it's not even a guideline, much less a regulation, it's only a policy. Um, and um, there's policies and there's policies. Once you're in front of a judge or court, you know, and they start asking the hard questions like, well, it's a policy. We are telling the states, you know, it's just a policy, but if you don't do it, we'll cut off all your funding. But it's only a policy. Um, there, this is this is why we have three branches of the government, because judges who are there for life, you know, they'll sit there and tell you, you can call it anything you want, but if it looks like a reg, acts like a reg, if a reg is law, I should say, regulation is law. Um, <clears throat> but the best way to explain it is I've learned most people have seen the movie Ghostbusters, right? Everyone has seen that movie. But remember the penultimate scene when Bill Murray, um, did I do this last year? Have I been? I don't know. I don't know. But I use it at conferences all the time because I get these quiz like, what's the policy guideline reg? It's also, so um, think of it this way. Bill Murray is racing up to the top of the skyscraper, right? And Sigourney Weaver has been taken over by the devil. And remember, he bursts into the room. Um, and she's on that bed, and she has got to mate with a male human being. Um, that's the whole point of what's going on in Ghostbusters. And remember when Bill Murray bursts into the room in his regalia, um, Sigourney Weaver is lying on that bed, and she turns it on. Um, and Bill Murray says something along the lines of, nah, nah, I got a rule against sleeping with women who are possessed by the devil. And then, you may recall, she really pours it on. And Bill Murray, relenting, goes, well, it's more of a guideline. Um, <clears throat> when we talk about planning, it's a lot like a guideline in most jurisdictions. <clears throat> um, planning goes through a major public effort, massive public hearing, massive public involvement. And it has elements, just like Sarah said. The basic elements in any plan, in any comp or master plan, these are the fundamental elements. There will always be a land use element. Where is the housing going to be? Where is the multifamily, single family housing? Industry, commercial, retail, mixed use, institutional, parks and recreation, all of these elements dealing with land use. There will be a zoning plan in most comp plans. They will actually say, this is what the zoning should be. In other words, saying what the law should be to implement the plan. You will see that in a classic plan. This is what the zoning ought to do. You will also see a transportation element, um, and you'll see an environmental or natural resource element. And as Sarah pointed out, depending upon the state you're in, <clears throat> some state laws will dictate all the elements that must be in the local plan. Some states, they just say you should have a plan. Some states, they don't, they, they don't care that much. They'll say you should have a plan, 
But if you don't, it's not the end of the world. In some states, they'll say, you can't have zoning unless you've got a comp plan. And those are the states that take the plan very seriously. If you're in the Washington area, to so bring it down to cases, just because so all of you live here, at least temporarily, if not permanently, because you're sitting in this room, classic cases right where we're sitting. In Maryland, on the north side of Potomac River, Maryland takes planning very seriously. In fact, zoning is supposed to follow local comp plans. Under Maryland law, every county and municipality must have a plan, and zoning must follow the plan. You cross the river into Virginia, um, they encourage planning, and they like planning, um, but it's only a guide, and zoning can be changed like that. So let me talk about zoning. Um, I mentioned, oh, did you? Yeah. I just wanted to add more, right. more criticisms of planning, because um, <laughs> you know, Gus was sort of piling on some of the criticisms, and I just wanted to add, um, people do criticize plans for being unevenly enforced. So, you know, when a developer comes in, they may be able to massage the plan and, and get changes that, they, that somebody else uh, might not have gotten if they dangle certain things in front of the, the local board that decides. Um, there's also the information problem. So how do we get enough information to plan? So planning didn't stop the rise of the automobile, didn't stop global warming, the contributions of our cities to, uh, to climate change. Um, and so there's some questions about whether planners have enough information. Uh, then there's the political dimension of planning. So plans are often recommended by staff but adopted by a city council or local legislative body. <coughs> So when you have uh, a, uh, that process can get very politicized for obvious reasons. I'll just, I'll leave it at that. Well, in fact, that's a very important point because you always want to know who the player is. All we want to, you always want to know who's the final decision maker in anything that you're involved in, whether it's your life, your personal life, or your professional life. Who's the final decision maker here? Local comp plans that are uniformly across the United States adopted by local not adopted by the mayor or the county executive, or it's the local legislative body, the city council, the county board of commissioners. And that's a very political process. There's only one exception in the entire United States and you're sitting in it, and that's the District of Columbia. Because DC, being neither, you know, not being a state, and just so you know, uh, <clears throat> I have to point this out to people in DC because they never think about it. DC, the comp plan for DC, and they have a very specific comp plan, very detailed, hundred elements to it, is not adopted by the D.C. Council. The only jurisdiction in America where that's the case. It's adopted by an appointed commission. Except for D.C., though, wherever you may be working, it's going to be adopted by the local legislative body. So it gets very political, as Sarah said. And D.C. is a circle of very political. Um, D.C. Um, is, is no more nor, nor less political than any other place. I'll tell you, um, there's nothing more political. Well, I'll just leave it that everything's very political. Life is political. Life is politics. Um, anyway, okay, I was, okay, never mind. Zoning, zoning. Zoning, so zoning, Alvin. Zoning, there's two kinds of zoning. And as the outline points out, just keep this in mind, there's comprehensive zoning and individual zoning. And this is important to understand. Let's say you adopt the comp plan. So the city or the county, the town, adopts their comp plan. How do you implement the comp plan? Well, you do it through your capital improvements budget. You do it through any ordinances that you have. You're following the plan. But the big thing to implement the comp plan is your zoning ordinance. And that's why comp plans often have a zoning element in it. And then when they adopt the plan, the next thing they do in most jurisdictions is do a comprehensive rezoning of that jurisdiction. And what does that mean? It basically means by the magic word comprehensive, it affects more than one property. And it's being initiated by the local government itself. So that's what a comprehensive rezoning is. And therefore, because it affects more than one property and it's initiated by the local government, it is a legislative act, which means to contest it in court is bloody hard. If you're an angry neighbor, an angry developer, an angry anybody, it's very hard to attack the comprehensive rezoning of the community. <coughs> now, there's individual rezoning, and that's when you're more familiar with you hear about when you read in your local newspaper because you're living someplace that some some horrible person, and um, they're always horrible if you're against what they're proposing, um, 
is now petitioning the local government to rezone the property down the block for whatever. It doesn't matter what it's for. They want a rezoning. Well, that's an individual rezoning. It's affecting that property. That gets very interesting because every jurisdiction allows for individual rezonings. Now, there are the jurisdictions that say you can't rezone unless the comp plan makes the recommendation for that use. So if you want to put a Walmart there and the comp plan says that area is meant for residential use and now the person's coming in for a Walmart, odds are the rezoning will be turned down by the local legislative body because it doesn't meet the comp plan. How do you get around that if you're the applicant? There's two ways. If you're in a jurisdiction in a state where the comp plan is only a guide, not that big a deal, zoning is everything, you can sometimes, this is just the way it is, you can get the rezoning because the plan is so mushy, you can get around it somehow. But in most places, you go through a two-step process. As you can imagine, you amend the comp plan. And that's what is usually occurs. The comp plan then goes through an entire public hearing process in front of the planning commission, and most jurisdictions, I would think, I would think, Sarah, every jurisdiction that has a comp plan has a planning commission. I've never heard of a situation where there was a comp plan that wasn't a planning commission. So if, if, if you've got a comp plan, you're gonna have a planning commission. And a planning commission is an appointed body. They're put there either by the chief executive officer of the local government and or with the local legislative body. So they're the ones, the, the mayor, the county executive, the local legislative body, they're appointing the people to sit on that planning commission. Planning commission's job is to draft the comp plan. It's also to give advice on rezonings and all kinds of land use things to the elected officials, the mayor, the county executive, the local legislative body. And they don't always draft the comp, comp plan themselves, so they'll have staff, oh, yeah. they'll hire consultants, so they, they read it and make the recommendations, but they don't draft it themselves. So you have this whole, um, you know, this whole professional uh, field commissions, city planning commissions, and you have zoning boards who may be actually elected, uh, but they may also be appointed. But both groups are supported by a staff, a, 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 a staff uh, or uh, at least outside consultants. Exactly. So the individual rezoning is being petitioned by an applicant. That's the point. It could be um, the property owner, it could be a developer, someone who has a contract on the property could be the applicant. Um, they then go through the same public hearing process that you would go through um, for, to do a plan or to do a comp rezoning. You go before the planning commission, <clears throat> there are hearings, staff is writing reports and making recommendations, all that is going on. In the end, an individual rezoning is also got to be approved or disapproved by the local legislative body. Now, what makes that unique um, is that, as you can imagine, um, when someone is asking to rezone a particular piece of property. They either have a specific land use in mind, or maybe they don't. It's wise to have a specific land use and let the world know what it is, because otherwise, as I say, people fear the unknown, and they will come in and attack, and it makes perfect sense if you say they're seeking to rezone this area from residential to industrial. Well, we don't know what they have in mind, but the zoning ordinance, and this is the thing to understand, Zoning ordinance does several things, but here's what a zoning ordinance does. It tells you what the uses are that can be in that zone. So it might be, based on the zone that your property is in, it might say you can have single family housing, you can have multifamily housing, you can have small retail shops, and that's it. So there are two kinds of uses in zoning ordinances across the United States, and this is uniform in all the states and the District of Columbia. There are in zoning, it's called permitted uses, and that means you have it as a matter of right. So the zoning ordinance will tell you, these are the uses that you can have, residential, multifamily, residential, single, commercial, mixed use, whatever the uses are that are laid out for that zone. Though you will have permitted uses as of right. Then you have the second category. These are called, across the United States, either special exception uses or conditional uses. What that means is that well, if you meet certain criteria 
that are laid out in the zoning ordinance, then you might be able to get that use. Now, let me give you a concrete example so it's not so crazy and abstract. Classic special exception or conditional uses would be this. Suppose the zoning ordinance says, as a permitted use, you can have retail stores in this zone that we put you in. And retail stores would include drug stores. Okay, fine. Banks. Okay, fine. Um, fast food restaurants. Fine. Permitted uses. What if you want to have a drive through bank, um, a drive-in restaurant, something like that? That is a classic special exception or conditional use. Why? Gets back to something Cyrus said a little while ago. Because now it means that people are going to be driving up in their cars to get the drugs from the drugstore, the food from the restaurant, do the banking. They're driving up. There's going to be a lot of driving and coming in and out of driveways. And if it's a restaurant, there's a litter. Because people sometimes are not good, and they'll eat the sandwich and throw the paper out the window. Um, so the point is, that's a classic example of special exception or conditional uses. Well, to do that in any zone in America, if you petition for a special exception use, oh, here's another classic example. If you live in a neighborhood wherever you grew up, and you got a doctor's office in the neighborhood, classic special exception use. If you were in a neighborhood and there was, um, you know, everyone had single family houses, but the guy on the corner was in, um, a dentist and had a dental office in there. You know, maybe your doctor was that kind of a doctor, your pediatrician, you went there. Classic special exception use. And it's always going to be tied to, in this country, is there going to be a traffic, um, an unusual traffic impact in a normally quiet residential area? And that's what special exception and conditional uses are about. They go through a very special hearing process across the country. So you have to understand that with zoning, therefore you've got comprehensive zoning, purely legislative, if you're an applicant, therefore, and you want something done, what should you be doing if you're advising that person? Here's what you should be doing to get down to cases from what we're talking about in terms of planning and zoning, and that is the best way to do it is to participate in the planning process when a plan is being rewritten or written so that whatever you have in mind for that property, the plan allows for. And then you want to get the zoning to allow for it too. And therefore, the community in adopting the plan is saying, yeah, we're going to have big box retail over there. That's where it's going to be, over there. And then, it's good. And once the plan is adopted, you do a comprehensive rezoning so that you don't have to go through the individual rezoning process, which is a hellish thing for anyone to go through. It's like going to a proctologist. And so you want to avoid that if you possibly can. Let the community do it, and then all you've got to do is going for your special hearings and special permits, and that's when you get involved in stuff that we'll get into later, dealing with details, site plan stuff, design stuff, things like that. But the big picture items have been done. Otherwise, otherwise what you're doing is you're going to either be seeking to amend the comp plan, which is not easy in most places, or you're going in with an individual rezoning, which if you are, you better hope it conforms and this is the key in American law. Is it in conformance with a comprehensive plan? If it is, it's easier for the local government to say, okay with the re local individual rezoning. But if it's deemed not in conformance with the local comprehensive plan, it's easy for the local legislative body to say, you're not going to get that individual rezoning. So just one thing I wanted to add, going back to your dentist example and, and, and talking about comprehensive uh, planning in general, there is such a thing as a non so, um, so one possibility for the doctor's office in the residential neighborhood could be that they got a special exception or special permit or whatever, um, how, whatever the zoning uh, ordinance uh, requires. Another possibility is that that place was always operated as a doctor's office, and um, because it, and at the time of the creation of the zoning ordinance or at the time of the creation of the comprehensive plan, um, that plan or that zoning ordinance took into account land uses that existed at the time. So clearly, as zoning and planning swept across the country, a lot of times uh, the land that was being dealt with was already being used for one purpose or another. So the concept of a non-conforming use arose to protect those 
properties that were already being used in a particular way from having to then comply with um, uh, the newly adopted zoning reform of the ordinance. So I just wanted mm -hmm. to, to have that concept out there um, you know, as, as, as a second alternative. The exception to a non-conforming use type of, uh, of allowance for uses that uh, may not conform <coughs> to a current comprehensive plan is a use uh, that becomes so undesirable that it is required to be phased out. And so one great example of this, uh, if you went to Times Square before Rudy Giuliani was mayor, um, it was filled with unsavory establishments of all kinds, viewing booths and adult uses and you know, all of these kinds of things. And if you've been to Times Square since, um, it's filled with Toys R Us and Broadway shows and you know, the tickets booth and all of these sort of family-friendly uses. What happened while Giuliani was mayor uh, was that those uses were slowly phased out, um, that, they were, that they were so undesirable that they were given uh, a period uh, where they, could be, they wouldn't have to be phased out. And that's another strategy that land use regulators have to get uh, a non-conforming or a, you know, a use that's been around for a while uh, phased out is that they can mandate that from top down as long as that period is reasonable and there's a reason for it. And in that case, you know, too, there was a, a plan for to the Times Square area that didn't include these sorts of establishments, which were then banished to the west side of Highway. Uh, but I, again, just to throw that out as an as a alternative. Uh, and, and and that's a very yeah non-conforming use is a, an important concept because you you got to imagine well what they do you know these uses were there before they ever adopted the zone, so you know what about those uses you know do they have to go away not necessarily the thing that. Sarah's talking about the, the term that's used, the, the legal word that's used about where you're trying to phase out the uses is they, they have the an amortization period. <clears throat> it often happens like with billboard ordinances where they're trying to get billboards out of the community. And these lead to um, incredible legal battles um, because again, it raises the taking issue. And you know, often with amortization, if it isn't done correctly and wisely by local government, the property owner is claiming a taking of their property without just compensation which triggers the taking issue, which I mentioned in the opening with the outline about the constitutional provisions. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> because um, underlying all of this are the state and federal constitutions which protect private property. If you think of this conceptually, and the biggest picture of all, um, it's not necessarily this way in other parts of the world, but in the United States, you know, we take it as a given, it's like breathing, but the federal and state constitutions, the state constitutions all have the same clauses. <clears throat> they explicitly protect private property. They do it through the due process clause and the takings clause in the Fifth Amendment, where that's where it trigger, is triggered. And then through the Fourteenth Amendment, it's applicable right to the states. So because of those private property protections through due process and just compensation clauses, this whole thing about non-conforming uses can trigger a takings attack by a property owner if a local government isn't smart about how to phase out an unwanted a lulu, as we call it, locally unwanted land use. The use that was there, you know? they It was there, it's been there. I mean, zoning was first, just so you understand, zoning's been around in this country for less than 100 years. First ordinance was in New York City in 1960. Uh, this is in 2012, so it's less than, you know, it's, it's something we imported from Germany. Um, New York City adopted it in 1916. U.S. Supreme Court in 1926 said zoning is constitutional so you can do it, um, and from the Supreme Court decision, once they said it's, it's kosher, then bang, local governments throughout the country began adopting zoning ordinances. Um, so you have lots of uses out there. You know, it could be a gravel pit. You know, and then what happens is subdivisions get built up around it. And then one day, people wake up and go, How I, where'd that gravel pit come from? We gotta get rid of that gravel pit. And the gravel pit owner is saying, hey, I've been here since 1892. You people just moved in 20 years ago. Who are you to say, I have to leave? You're the one who came to me. Um, Under Nixon's law, that concept would have been coming to the nuisance defense for the, prop, for the gravel pit owner. They could say, you know, if, if we were not dealing with 
patients, you have different financial um, abilities. You know, oftentimes you have just a few key players in the neighborhood that are leading a fight that benefits everybody. It's a free riding problem when you have people who are, who are going to act regardless of everybody's involvement. And everybody else says, all right, we'll just free ride on the fact that they've hired an attorney to sue the gravel for those people. Exactly. So when you get down to the zoning thing, the other thing to keep in mind is in the zoning there's two basic features which are very important. One is the zoning text, one is the zoning map. They're related but different. People often mix them up. So just so you understand, the text is the actual words of the zoning ordinance where they're laying out what are the uses, what are the heights that are allowed, setback requirements, all of this stuff laid out about the use of the space that you're zoning. That's the text going through all of that stuff. The map is literally the zoning map, which literally is a map of the town or the city or the county, and it lays out, here's the map, everyone can see based on where they live or where they have their business that you're in the R60 zone, R being residential. You're in the I3 zone, I meaning industrial. You can look at the map and say, oh, I'm in the R60 zone. Oh, that means I can build a Oh, I'm in the I-3 zone. That means I can have a factory. That's the map. So you've got the text and the map. Every zoning ordinance in this country has text and map. They're different but related, as you can imagine. When local legislative bodies are amending the zoning, redoing the zoning, there's two ways to do this. <clears throat> and then this, again, is important to understand as a practitioner. Um, you can amend the text. Think about this. You could amend the text to say, well, okay, in the R60 zone, we're going to amend the text to say, now you can have factories in the R60 zone. And, okay, it's called R60, but we've now added a new use in the text, factories. Okay? You could do it that way, or as a text amendment, which is legislative, because you see, you're changing the text of an ordinance, so it's legislative. Unless, because there's always an exception to every rule, <coughs> unless you're amending the text Target say a property. Okay, you could be doing that. Trust me, it can happen. I'm involved in a case now, which this is exactly what a local legend. They thought they were being smart. They're going to find out how smart they are. So they amended the text, and they thought they were getting around a certain law by doing the text and not the map. Um, uh, but they were targeting a property. Well, normally, as you all know, if you change the text of a law, that's a legislative act. And why is this important? Because if you're ever in front of a judge. Bottom line is, if you're challenging a legislative action in front of a judge, judges give massive deference to a local legislative body in terms of their laws. Even the Chief Justice of the United States has done that in a recent ruling. Great deference, you know, looking for a way to find out how can I, you know, how can I do it. Um, or you change the matter. You can literally say, and this is what most people, when you hear the word rezoning, I want to get my property rezoned, they usually mean a map amendment. What they usually mean is, I want to go from an R60 zone on my property to an I3 zone. By doing that, I'm automatically industrial, and I can do whatever I want based on the text of the industry, I3 zone. It's important to understand these concepts because if you're advising somebody, whether you're advising the agency, you're advising an applicant, you're advising the Sierra Club, I don't care who, you've got to understand these concepts. You could do it through the map amendment, you could do it through a text amendment. They all have different implications. You're going down different but related paths with different implications about outcomes. And everyone is always thinking, the smart people, how is this going to be viewed by a judge if this is in front of a court? And it gets down to how much deference is given to the government or the agency versus how little deference. And here's the point. You'll see it in the outline. If it's deemed legislative, massive deference to the local government. If it's deemed quasi-judicial, administrative, you're basically now focusing on a property or a one single whomever. Then judges begin to say, hey, I don't care what you're calling it. You know, we're going to look, we're going to do real fact-finding here to figure out if the record justifies what you did to that property owner. And it gets back to the fact that the entire land use system in this country is grounded in 
state and federal constitutions which say we protect private property rights. If you didn't have that, basically you could have, like in some places, you could really have a lot more authority in the government to do whatever it wanted to do. But it's that backstop in the Constitution that causes the courts, whether you're in a local court or a federal, uh, state court or federal court, to take a hard look. And with zoning, um, when you're in court, bottom line is, again, nine times out of ten, you're always in a state court. Deference is generally given to the local legislative body, but if you're focusing on one property, then judges are going to be given a hard look at what's going on. And, and I just, I mean, on a purely superficial note, everything that Gus says is, is right here. Um, on a purely superficial note, um, it, it's a really fun thing to go to your locality's website and click on the zoning map, because you can actually see what you can find where you live, where you work, or whatever, and uh, it's color-coded, and you can kind of cross-reference. Um, I really like, the, I mean, I like the pace of a land use law professor, but I think it's a really fascinating to actually go to the zoning map and see. You can see there's a sea of purple, and then there's like a, you know, red square within that sea. And you think, how did that happen? And you think, oh, wait, that's the, you know, such and such property. And then you sort of get, get thinking about, I mean, I would encourage you, if you're interested at all in this area, to, to start very local. I mean, I'm like super, 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 I realized this morning that I get news about my 30 block neighborhood from five different sources a week. I have two free newspapers. I read like three different blogs that are only about my neighborhood, which is like kind of bizarre. But <coughs> um, but I really think if you understand, if you want to understand land use law, one of the best ways to do it is to sort of look around you where you live and to start with something like um, as, as, as easy to read and as visual as the zoning map. And then to refer, refer back to the text um, and get a sense of, uh, you know, what are those, those colors and those code signs. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing just to note on, and, and now to flip it back to Sarah, is that when we talk about the neighborhood, um, it's a very complex um, uh, dynamic always at play. Um, uh, there are neighbor the bottom line is this, um, through my experience of, of doing this for uh, 38 years now, um, 15, and you, this is just a rule I've learned in politics, in life, in law, in land use. It just, I don't care what the issue is. If you're in a room, there's 800 people in that room, and 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 it's dealing with some controversial thing that's being proposed, and no one knows where it's going to go. 15%, um, right off the bat, 15% are for it. 15% <laughs> are against it. And the middle 70% isn't sure. The smart advocate, the smart consultant, and Sarah mentioned with planning that you know these plans are drafted by planners um, who are either professional staff at the agency, at the local government, or they're planning consulting firms. Applicants, developers, builders, who's ever companies who are proposing to do something, they have a team. The smart ones, the wise ones have a team. They've got a planner, they've got if, if it deals with historic if there's any historic preservation issues, they've got a historic preservation consultant. They've got their legal consultant, which is someone like a person in this room. Um, they may have an architectural consultant. Um, it's a team. They'll have a public relations consultant. This happens for anything that's either complex or controversial. And by the way, it can be a tiny thing being proposed, but if it's controversial, it can take as long to get done. There is nothing more controversial than trying to build two houses in an infill development in a developed area. That is more difficult to do in many ways than trying to build 500 house subdivision on the edge of a community where the only constituents out there might be cows and sheep and a few people. And in terms of the dynamic to understand in terms of people, here's another, so you've got that middle 70%. They're not sure where they're going. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. Do, well, animal rights. Um, so any ordinances do cover animal husbandry. Um, <laughs> Even in big cities, they'll have things about whether you can have one chicken or two chickens. Seriously, um, you will find this in zoning ordinances. I but think there's a big controversy about trying to change that urban uh, urban chicken co-op. Correct. It is yeah. right out of um, that TV show Portlandia. <laughs> I knew that would. I knew see because see, I may have been born in the 40s, 
But as my daughters will tell me, I'm still with it. Um, I knew when the song came on the radio that that group was fun and they're out of New York. And, and I'm like, you know who that is? Yeah. I know. Not all Beatles. Um, Portlandia, did you ever see the episode? You know, you know Portlandia from IFC, right there? And on Animal Husbandry, there they are in Portland and they're interrogating the poor waitress about the provenance of the chicken they're about to eat, remember? That was, that's the classic episode. But there, I'm, I'm thinking as a land use guy, I'm watching this episode, I'm laughing my head off because it's so funny the way they wrote it, about, um, yeah, even in Portland, you know, they're gonna have in their zoning ordinance whether or not you can maintain in a single family residential zone in the city of Portland, can you have up to three chickens? And zoning ordinances will say you can have up to three but no more. Um, they, I mean, they'll have all this stuff in there. So. It sounds funny, but if the human mind can imagine it, it will be legislated. So with that middle 70%, my point is this. Whatever the process is, you have to understand, whoever you're representing, you gotta understand what are the processes that are available to us. Understand that most people in the community haven't made up their mind. And so the sophisticated, smart applicant always is smart enough never to come in with a fully formed proposal. That's my point. You come in with generally what you want to do, but the details, you sit down with community groups to work out the details. Should it be like this or like that? Should it be have access here or access there? Maybe it shouldn't be five stories, maybe it'll end up being three stories. Maybe instead of 12 stories, it'll be seven stories. But you work these things out. And in terms of the neighbor, I just want to close with this one comment, and that is there's two kinds of neighbors. In addition, in addition to those who are in support, those who are opposed, and the group that hasn't made up their mind yet, and that is there are what you call the real neighbors. The people who are to follow the nuisance analogy that Sarah talked about, which basically is the foundation of zoning. Um, these are the people within sight, sound, smell. They're down the road. But you've got the other kind, and this is very important to understand, you've got the third party interest groups. And they can be headquartered a thousand miles away, but they have a specific agenda. They have an agenda for or against something, and they have chapters all over the country. And this gives rise, just so you understand, to an important principle that affects everything we're talking about, and that's standing. And I just wanna say one word about standing, because it's so important. Everything we've talked about, you always have to keep in mind, what if this ends up in front of a judge? In most jurisdictions in America, except California and a few other places, standing is limited to those people who are deemed aggrieved. And aggrieved is defined in most jurisdictions in America as someone who is nearby will be personally hurt by the proposal, either through sight, sound, too many cars in front of their home, whatever. So you've got to have that aggrievement. Often they'll say, you can't take whatever the decision was by the local agency, you cannot take that to court if you did not participate down below in front of that agency. In other words, you can't hold back, assume they're going to approve something and you're against it, and then run to court to attack it. In most jurisdictions, you're out. You have no standing. You didn't participate down below, you have no standing here. The exception is those jurisdictions like California where bottom line is anybody has standing. Anybody can walk in and attack whatever the decision was by the local agency and the courts will say, fine, put the issues in front of us and let's litigate it. So standing is an important thing to keep in mind when you're involved in this land use process because you're always thinking at the back of your mind, whether your thing it gets approved or disapproved, someone might take it to court. What is that process?
Well, um, the U.S. Constitution says, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Um, so let's talk about three key parts of the takings clause. And this is not really a regulatory uh, issue uh, so much as uh, it is a sort of property rights issue. And so we're veering here into property law provide you with a uh, view of land use law that is not just the regulatory uh, matters. So taken, what does taken mean? Um, property can be taken either physically or by regulation. It's the regulatory takings cases that occupy uh, most of the court writings on, uh, on takings. Uh, <coughs> physical occupations uh, of any kind, uh, the Supreme Court has said, uh, are taking Regulatory takings, uh, it's uh, less clear uh, as to whether they're takings. There has to be a balancing test, and this is the Penn Central case, which I, I'm sure you've read in property. Uh, if you didn't, give me the name of your property professor. Uh, make sure you, the next uh, generation of students does, because it's a critical case in property and in land use as well. So the Penn Central balancing test is uh, how we decide regulatory takings, at least those that are brought under federal law, those cases brought under federal law, um, is something of public use. So this is where we get into uh, what is allowed, uh, uh, what local and state and even federal government is allowed to do the eminent domain. So what is a public use? There are three different ways to get to, uh, to satisfy the public use requirement. One type of public use is perhaps the most obvious public use, so um, public owned property. So things like a publicly owned hospital, publicly owned military base. So the state can transfer private property to public ownership for these kinds of purposes, and that will satisfy the public use requirement. A second type of transfer that is allowed railways, uh, uh, public utilities, even stadiums have been considered to be a common carrier under the legal definition of the term we call it for the first time. And the third category of cases involves a state taking private property and turning it over for some other uh, private use. So this is the most controversial, so a private use that is not most contra controversial cases, um, and this is what we've seen uh, in the news uh, a lot of times, and, and also through the years, especially at the Supreme Court level. So, the most famous case, and uh, raise your hand if you've heard of it, is the Kelo case, right? Has everybody heard of the Kelo case? So, in that case, we had a very sympathetic plaintiff who was uh, <coughs> suing under the by a local redevelopment authority, not the city itself, but a local redevelopment authority who had been transferred certain powers, including the power of eminent domain, um, the New London Development Corporation, the taking of her property for an overall redevelopment of uh, an entire neighborhood, the Fort Trumbull neighborhood, that was consistent with a comprehensive plan. So from the local public entity's perspective, they said, well, this is in, in accordance with a comprehensive plan for the area. Eminent domain is therefore justified as a public use here. We're trying to, to, to implement this comprehensive plan, this planning process. Um, the homes weren't blighted. It was a somewhat economically distressed community, but the homes, including Suzette Kilo's home, the named plaintiff, although she was joined by others, she was the named plaintiff and the most visible person. I don't, you've probably seen it. Um, as had been the case in some prior 
so the public purpose here was again, you know, the the uh, they gave real importance to the fact that there was a plan for the neighborhood. So plans can be soft, but plans can actually be really powerful in ways that um, the people who wrote the plans <coughs> might not have even envisioned, and we see that uh, in the Keeler case. Was uh, it sympathetic? Can I ask? Sure. A question on that. Um, I, I thought a big factor in that case was that there was going to be increased property taxes, but or at least that's how it was presented in my mind. Um, but do, so, you, do you think that the comp plan was more of an important factor? So I think well, one of the goals of the comp there's a lot of oftentimes comprehensive. So so the question was, to what extent was the increase in the property tax for the people on the phone? Uh, the the uh, it w was an increase in uh, the property tax base attractive to or uh, to the city, and to what extent did that um, influence the court's decision? And I think comprehensive plans can have many different competing goals, and I, I don't uh, remember exactly what was in the comprehensive plan, uh, you know, whether they had, I mean, I'm sure property taxes were certainly on the minds of the people writing. I don't remember if that was explicitly stated, I, 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 but I'm sure it was, I'm sure it was like economic development It usually is in a comp plan, but uh, the, I just remembered the court opinion act specifically talking about the tax base increase. As another justification. And I had to remember, I wasn't involved in land use all the time, so I didn't remember the comp plan aspect of it. Yeah, so it's, so it's all of the above. I mean, the, the, why did the city want to rezone? Why, why would they go through the massive effort of taking, you know, community members out of their homes, and in this case, igniting a national debate that involved property rights advocates around the country heaping criticism on the local decision makers that had made this decision. Why would they expose themselves to that? Well, they probably didn't think they would be on the national news every night, but they also probably thought that what they were doing was in the best interest of the city of New London, which uh, has been categorized in economic distress city and the state um, uh, you know, the ratings of cities for quite a while. And it is really Unfortunately, as it turned out, um, the company that they thought might have anchored a lot of that development never uh, expanded and in fact pulled out of um, the, the, the first phase of building that they had already done. I, I think their whole campus is abandoned and then the, the rest of the redevelopment hasn't occurred, but all of the houses have been torn down except for Suzette Kilos, which has been moved to another location. Um, so it's, I mean, or all or most of the houses, I mean, it's, you go there and local land use decision makers and local politicians' abilities to use eminent domain uh, in this way. Um, sometimes they've uh, changed the language um, uh, passed to the, uh, the Constitution. Five states at least have passed constitutional amendments. Um, sometimes they have, diff have, have had different uh, uh, procedural requirements um, uh, that have been passed, but I think it's an important trend. It sort of died down now, but at least for a few years after Kilo, there was a real wave of property rights backlash that has constrained uh, local decision makers' ability to do these sorts of large-scale planning. And by the way, this sort, sort of large-scale planning and kicking people out of their homes, um, it, you know, you can see that there's a lot of potential political pitfalls in such a strategy, and it's not clear why um, the city officials and the development uh, <laughs> corporation officials in New London didn't see that. But, I mean, we all know what happened uh, with urban renewal, which involved a lot, massive relocations of people, mostly um, ethnic and racial minorities and the poor. Um, entire neighborhoods were wiped out to make way for highways, um, large public works projects, the public housing, um, Le Corbusier-style, I guess for lack of a better word, public housing um, that, that occurred in the 1960s. But that, you would have thought that that had that era Seems like the property rights people have buckled down. All of that said, 
it's not clear that Kilo actually changed the state of um, federal takings law because you had some prior cases, the Berman case, um, which allowed the use of eminent domain on department stores that were uh, thriving in a, in a blighted neighborhood here in Washington, D.C. Um, this was a 1950s case. Uh, you had the Hawaii Housing versus Midka case, which allowed eminent domain to be used to correct a system of And they actually did want to get rid of it, but by the time they you know, were sort of able to sell it, the capital gains and, and taxes that they would have um, had to pay on the sale of the property made it undesirable for them to break it up. So actually most of the 72 landowners asked the sta state legislature to condemn their land and then to redistribute it and to pay them the proceeds and then to redistribute it as, um, you know, as if you know, they had themselves sold it to the people that was a way to break the, the, the hole uh, of those few on a lot of the land in Hawaii. And the Supreme Court said, so one of the landowners either changed his mind or you know, decided to sue because he didn't want to do it this way. Um, and the Supreme Court said, no, this sort of eminent domain is, is allowed too. So those two cases sort of suggest that Kilo wasn't really that much of a departure from, uh, from uh, prior Supreme Court jurisprudence. But by property rights advocates, it did generate a lot of backlash. Well, and, and you know, I'll just say, um, Kilo, from a practitioner point of view, is a classic example of an agency that screwed up so badly that the U.S. Supreme Court took the case. Um, I can tell you, I've been involved in a lot of these cases in the Supreme Court, um, these takings cases, um, wetlands cases over the years. <clears throat> it, it takes four votes of the nine to take a case. It takes five votes Kilo was completely mishandled, and it was fascinating because I was telling people at the time, I can't believe that they're, they're doing this the way they're doing it. Um, it got to the point where even the New York Times was writing editorials against the local authority. I mean, the Times was writing editorials. I mean, this was a newspaper that took advantage of the same type of law in New York City to get their New York Times building, <laughs> all right? Just so you understand. Um, but as a practitioner point to keep in mind, when you're dealing with that kilo apart was, as Sarah pointed out, it was not based on blight. So they weren't saying this was a slum. This was just lower middle class housing. And the other thing that was fascinating about it, when you, you, you read the record and read what was going on at the agency, and then the way it moved up to the Connecticut Supreme Court, you saw the divisions in that court, as well as the U.S. Supreme Court, they recognized this is not a blight case. That's important. And they're taking property from a group of private property owners who happen to be homeowners. I mean, there is nothing, nothing more sacrosanct in, in the American system of private property ownership than an individual homeowner. Um, somehow, you know, if you're a Walmart, you can go after them, it's easy. But if it's Suzette Kilo <coughs> and her neighbors in their single family homes and you're taking them away, there's, there's a visceral reaction. So what the agency did was knowing that, this was fascinating as it was going on, as the years went by and it was going up to Connecticut Supreme Court, I'm talking with people, I'm going up there, and I said, they can't be this stupid. And I remember one guy telling me, oh no, they can be this stupid. Um, they had a comp plan, but it was not a fully formed comp plan, I can tell you, it was not fully formed. They also had no binding commitments from the Pfizer company to actually commit to going in there once they did what they were gonna do. They had no binding commitment which as Sarah pointed out, in the end, Pfizer said after a few years went by, you know, our business plan has changed. We ain't going in there, goodbye. Um, and there was no recourse for the city. And there really was no recourse. There was nothing binding. They, and it was fascinating, they didn't even, and this was unbelievable, it's also discussed, by the way, in the Supreme Court opinion, majority and dissent. The other thing that was fascinating, <coughs> and the reason this was fascinating to me is I've been involved in these kinds of situations where you have a fully formed plan, you know exactly how every property is going to be used that you're taking. And then you have binding commitments across the board so that once you start down that road of imminent domain, of taking property from one group of private people to hand over to another private entity, 
This is not to build a school or a road or a library of public use. It's to hand over to Pfizer and company. Um, nothing was ever binding. And even the Kilo property, when you went there, they had in their plan no specific use designated literally for where her house was. It was like, we'll figure that out later. It was unbelievable. So this is why at the Connecticut Supreme Court, the briefing was fascinating and the argument was so intense. And when Connecticut in the end said, okay, the U.S. Supreme Court took it, Justice Stevens, in his majority opinion, was fascinating. He went out of his way to say, now look, based on federal Supreme Court precedent, we have to rule this way. Um, but, he, but of course, under your state constitutions, you could go in another direction. I mean, that, I mean, and everyone knew, of course, state constitutions, you, you, you could just do opposite what Connecticut did, which is what a lot of states have done, Michigan and on and on. The impact has been that out in California, they have now stripped their redevelopment authorities from this kind of authority under California law. It happened last which, year. Which you can see may be a mistake. Um, it, it's a mistake, but it's an example of what happens when an agency is wearing blinders, crosses a line, creates a political furor, and and as Sarah pointed out, you know, they made all these mistakes, but it was like they're going down a path and they're figuring, we've always done it this way, it's for the public good, it's, but in the end, it, they crossed the line. And it, what it led to was the overreaction so that it's very difficult now in this country to take private property from property owner A to hand it over to property owner B. But you can do it if you do have, it's crystal clear in all the decisions, state and federal, they say, if you have a binding, fully formed plan, if you have commitments across the board, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, then you could do this. It just didn't happen in Kilo, which is what led to the O'Connor dissent. And um, you know, it created this visceral reaction. So it's an object lesson, and it's not just an imminent domain, it's an object lesson if you're dealing with planning, zoning, subdivision controls, a whole range of using government authority. Um, of always understanding your limits, of always exercising some judgment and common sense, of always wondering, as I used to say to the planners that were under me when I chaired this powerful land use agency, which I did for a number of years, it was very powerful. How would this look? On whatever you're proposing, think about this. How would this look in the cold light of day on the front page of the Washington Post? How would this just look? You know, And it causes you to, to pull back and think and not get caught in that silo kind of thinking. And I, I urge that upon you, no matter what you end up doing in your professional life, because what happens to people so often, whether they're in private sector or public sector, is they get so used to doing it a certain way, they lose sight of, of maybe they cross the line, and then how is this going to look as you keep going? And that is what happened in Kilo, which was unfortunate. Yeah, so, so just to wrap up our eminent domain uh, conversation, um, I just wanted to talk about that third component of um, the takings clause theme, and that's just compensation. So Gus was pointing out that you know, the home is so important uh, to people, of course, and it's related to your identity. Um, these days, federal law and many state laws actually provide additional compensation for people whose homes have been taken from them. Um, the federal law also uh, provides for reasonable Just the figure based on strict rules or regulations. So there's a lot of different ways to calculate uh, what is just compensation. Uh, starting with you know, what is the value of the property, and then sometimes including these little bonuses that I talked about, which is surpluses for homes, uh, maybe moving expenses, and that kind of thing. So I think we should um, wrap up there. There's
questions. Yeah, and I'll just touch very quickly um, <clears throat> because there's too much to cover in a short period of time. <laughs> um, but I just want to mention, as we have in the outline, that you've got all these federal environmental statutes. And I know there are people here from EPA and various federal agencies. These federal environmental statutes, of course, um, are not land use laws. Um, but in another level, they are. And the point is, just to understand, if you're a practitioner in this field, you, you have your local ordinances, your plan, your zoning ordinance, your subdivision ordinance, and then you may have things like the historic preservation ordinance, impact fee ordinance, things we haven't had a chance to talk about, <coughs> which are mentioned in the outline. Um, but you have all of these layers of local land use control. Then you've got the state laws. State laws are the enabling statutes for planning and zoning, but also you will have state environmental laws. So never lose sight of the fact that if you're talking about, say, wetlands, everyone, the press, reporters, they talk about wetlands regulation. I'm just using this as an example. And it always leads to everybody federal wetlands regulation under the Federal Clean Water Act. Never lose sight of the fact that most of the states have state wetland statutes. They have state statutes, um, state endangered species statutes. So your states have these statutes, and they pick up where the feds leave off because of the sovereignty issue between federal and state governments. So I mentioned that the states have them. As far as the federal environmental laws, they then come into play with a local land use. And they'll come into play in a variety of ways. You may have a federally jurisdictional wetland on a piece of property that is proposed for some kind of development. Therefore, you're not only dealing with a local plan and a local zoning ordinance and maybe some state stuff, but you may be dealing with the Army Corps of Engineers and the EPA because there's a federally jurisdictional wetland there. Um, National Historic Preservation Act may be involved because you've got something that's eligible historic preservation-wise on the national list. And so it may trigger that. All of these things, Clean Air Act, other provisions of the Clean Water Act, which we don't have the time to get into but are just mentioned in the outline, the point is they all factor into local land use controls. If you ask a congressman or senator, of either party, does the federal government do local land use control? They will put their hand on a Bible and the other hand on the heart and go, oh my God, no. Um, that's for the local governments. I'm a senator, <coughs> I'm a congressman. You know, total BS. Um, you will learn as a practitioner that, that federal agencies are deeply involved in local land use. Some of them want to be, some of them don't want to be, but the laws and the regs under those laws push them in that direction. So you have to know as a land use practitioner whether or not you're going to be dealing with some federal jurisdictional issue, and it's endangered species, wetlands, um, whatever, it happens. Um, <clears throat> the other thing to keep in mind in this whole area that we're talking about, and this is the practitioner dynamic, no government officer likes a government officer from a higher level, level of government. So if you're dealing with local, they don't like state people telling them what to do. Just like they don't like the federal people telling the state people telling the local people what to do. Now, <clears throat> does this mean they don't talk with each other among local, state, federal? Of course not. <clears throat> you have relationships. There are human relationships. But from an institutional point of view, if you're involved in this land use game, you will discover that you know, aside from statutes, ordinances, and regulations, you've got the interstices here of agency, um, I'm not going to say coordination, relationships. And sometimes those are good relationships, and sometimes they're antagonistic relationships. And it's both horizontal and vertical. Vertical is what I just described to you. The locals don't like the state telling them what to do. The states don't like the feds telling them what to do. You've got the horizontal, too. You've got the horizontal relationships and all of this stuff where you've got economic development officials here, you've got planning officials here, you've got environmental officials here. They're in the same level of government, whether it's local, state, or federal, but they've got very different missions and very different agendas. So whatever the proposal is, whether it's for a shopping center, a housing development, a highway interchange, we have these relationships, and they all impact on local land even if it's state or federal st um, statutes or regs coming into play, they have to deal with the local officials. And that's the bottom, bottom, bottom line. They've got to deal with those local officials at the end of the day. 
And <clears throat> the smart agency people know how to do it and understand what the limits are. And anytime there's overreaching, Kilo is just one example of an agency that overreached, but it happens all the time. This is what leads people to have editorials written in newspapers or people having court decisions that they're not too thrilled about. So, uh, we'll do, uh, I guess we have maybe seven minutes left for questions. We'll try to do them rapid fire, 30 second mm -hmm. answers or something like that. Yes, in the back. Um, I have a question for both of you. I was hoping perhaps you could address it sort of on the 30,000 foot level and um, you could get closer to home, DC in particular. And that is about um, the relationship between a sort of smart growth and sustainability movement and land use and zoning. And my question is about density. Mm -hmm. That is sort of the key mm -hmm. that it all turns on. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious, uh, given the history of, for instance, the urban renewal movement where they plowed on through, they knew what was best and everything was gonna be bright and shiny in the future. Uh, I'm just <laughs> curious where you see, if any, the weaknesses in the push for more density. Uh, again, sort of on a, mm -hmm. on a, a sort of philosophical level, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But then also in DC in particular, where they're undergoing a huge zoning rewrite right now. Mm -hmm. My understanding is they're making big changes in the of right use of a lot of the, um, even residential areas. So mm -hmm. for instance, people be able to, if they want to, essentially do infill construction on their, their residential home because they want to densify the city as much mm -hmm. as possible. Um, and so I'm just curious to hear, as they say, both the, the 30,000 foot perspective and then also um, the specific proposals for DC. So I'll just repeat the question for those on the phone and it, it relates to density <coughs> and the, the role of density and, and smart growth, promotion of density in uh, zoning changes both globally and uh, in DC. And, um, you know, I mean, from a personal perspective, I think uh, when we're talking about cities, what people 
people fear. The other part of it is congestion, because people don't like congestion. The irony being, of course, that without congestion you have dead places. The, the places that everybody wants to go to and visit, you know, Paris, London, San Francisco, the most congested places in the world. Everyone wants to be there. Um, you know, it reminds me of steep slope um, rules across this country. You can't put housing on steep slopes, then everyone travels, at least the people with the jet set, they all travel to Italy to look at the quaint villages, which are all on steep slopes. Um, so it's, you know, you know, you've got to understand that dynamic. And your question about how does it relate to what's going on in DC, which is not unusual in any part of this country, the recommendation now in DC, like other big cities in America, is to take infill development and say, geez, let's have it maybe ground floor retail and a few stories of housing above it. Um, that sort of thing in a snapshot. Um, that will be viewed as a threat to any single family neighborhood. So it has to be done very carefully in the right places along major boulevards. Um, and it has to, you have to go through an entire process and not all of it will be successful. You have to work with the local community. That's the bottom line, is working with the local community using my 15%, 15%, 70% rule, because you will always have a dedicated minority against whatever. The question is, where is that middle going to land? And I think that's actually